Yeah. Okay, you guys are getting a one-on-one. -on -one. No. Okay, let's start it. So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our next Dev Community meeting. Uh, today we're doing something really interesting. It's Scikit-Learn. Super important. We're doing pre-processing and a little extra. I can't, I can't say it yet. But, but David has something. Oh, I should hide it. <laughs> I should hide yeah. it before we maybe, share the deep note. Maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe hide that those while I, I talk about it. Um, but uh, I, I hope you guys missed us. You know, we, we missed doing the, the meeting last week, but of course, very understandable and uh, it was a very sad loss. So I hope that this week we can start off the week positive and uh, hopefully learn something. So let's let's do it. Let me um, let me share the link in the chat. Oh, or David. Did. Cool. Uh, let us know if that works for you. So Deep Networks. Uh, and let me. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. So it looks like it worked. Um. So let me let me share my screen just in case somebody. Like to to do second do that right now. Boom and perfect. Can you guys see my screen? Good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So that is my email. Okay, so um First off, let's start off with an art piece. Uh, this is a, it was made by, uh, a, he signed by DL. Uh, we're not really sure it's an aspiring artist uh, with a mask. No, it's, it's David. David made this in Microsoft Paint uh, just for you guys, low, low custom. Uh, he didn't charge. And normally his rates are pretty competitive, but uh, uh, yeah, so this is your brain on scikit-learn uh, because it's, really an incredible uh, library. And that starts me off with, um, you know, what is scikit-learn? Uh, scikit-learn, just like we, we covered pandas and uh, matplotlib, is a library that we can use in Python. And it's specifically made for um, machine learning um, or like AI in general and other like difficult stats stuff. Uh, it's, it's a very, very big library. So we're gonna cover uh, some pretty important things today. I'm going to try to keep it at 10 minutes, maybe, so that David has a bunch of time because his stuff, you're going to want to listen and uh, understand it. Um, and so we're going to start off, it's going to be, again, pandas. We've talked about how important this is because we still use it. And um, so we're, we're going to read all our CSVs, just like last, last week. Shouldn't be a problem. Uh, make it into one big uh, data frame. Again, not a problem. You know, we did this last week, should be very, very clear. Let me know if, if you have any questions, not a problem. Um, so here's where we start to get into new waters, uncharted waters. Uh, so what we see here, the DF mega mi missing um, is what we're doing is we're, we have our data frame, which is the one we just made excuse me, that has all the, the CSVs um, from the bike data that we were using last week. So what we wanna do is we take the data frame and we use is null. So it's gonna give Boolean values, so true or false of, is it a null value? And th this is what we're looking for. We're going to handle missing values, extremely important. Um, and then we're gonna sum it to make it into this uh, data frame. And before I run it, um, why is it important to handle missing values in your data? Because you don't want to be giving your model a null value or a value that just will throw an error in your model. You wanna make sure when you're cleaning your, your data, which is referred to as pre-processing, that you're um, uh, getting rid of those missing values or filling it, which we will cover in a little bit. Um, so, uh, also why, why did this, uh, if you just run this as like dot head, um, it will give you the same 
but sometimes you want to make sure. I uh, just wanted you guys to know that you can do this to look at all the values uh, just to be safe. Uh, so let's run it. And OK, this is going to give us, um, because of the code that we wrote here, this is going to give us the, the values that um, are null. How many values are null in these columns? And there's a lot. I mean, this is not, not a good thing. You don't want this many nulls, null values uh, in any case, and especially not 50K. Um, so that's a problem, and we're going to fix it. Um, in terms of what data we want, um, we're going to be get, getting rid of some of these columns because they're just not reliable to us or not useful. Uh, and so some of those is the start station ID. We don't need the ID uh, for our purpose. Uh, and same with end station ID. The bike ID, we don't need it. The member of birth year, we, we don't really need to know their, their age uh, for our purposes. Uh, end station name, we do need to know that, but we don't want to feed it into our model because this is ultimately one of the things we want to um, work with and predict. So if you're feeding that in, your model is just going to uh, falsely give you the right values because you're giving it the answer. You know, you want it to understand the problem without cheating. <laughs> um, and then the gender is also not important to, to what we're doing. So we create our new data frame uh, without all the, the different uh, columns. These are all the columns. And now we have the, the stuff that we really want. And if we look at this, uh, we have January, which is a string. Uh, we have uh, the, the station name also, well, they're actually objects, but uh, for, for the same purpose, it's you know, a string or an object. Um, you can see here, it says object. Um, and then you have subscriber slash customer and so on, but you only have one numerical value. So that's something that we're gonna want to account for uh, also, but uh, right now it doesn't really matter. Um, Okay, so now we have, um, so we have our, our new data frame, which uh, I call DF Mega Updated, and uh, you'll see throughout. I use a lot of extra data frames, but really, you don't want to be creating new data frames and data frames. It's kind of slow it down, and you're not going to uh, have a fun time if you do this a lot. So it's, it's bad practice, but because we're we're teaching you guys. The concepts, it's not an issue. So I'm running the exact same code as before, except on this new uh, updated thing, uh, updated data frame, um, because I want to see how the values change. Do we still have any null ones? And we do. In start station name, we do have uh, null values, which is not good. So let's go into removing missing values. So one of the ways that we can do is we want to say, okay. If we have if we have two hundred thousand um, data points on something, um, will seven hundred and forty five really affect it? Maybe it's just easier and more accurate to throw out of uh, throw out those values. And uh, <laughs> skeleton gender set, yeah, you know, we, not important to us. Um, but uh, so. We can actually drop this, and this is a, a pandas function. So we're still in pandas uh, for now, but it's very important. Um, so we can use dot drop na to drop all the na values. Um, so like nan stands for not a number. So it's just like a fill in value, but sometimes it can be null too. Uh, so this is going to be, we have our new data frame, and we dropped all of them, just deleted them from our data frame. Now, you normally don't want to do this uh, unless you really have so much data, but it's not the best thing. It's more like if you're in a hurry or something. So let's see if we have any uh, null values still left. I don't know why it's not running. It is running. Um, so it's giving us zero values. Um, there are no missing values. So this is a really good sign. Yes, very good sign. Um, so there you go. You could use that data. But 
We can also do what's called imputing missing values. And this is the filling in of, of values because we don't, we might not want to get rid of all the null values because they have other data attached to it, but we still, we still want to get rid of that NA value or NAN value, right? So imputing just means the filling of values. And now you got a new keyword to use to sound very fancy, imputing. Um, and you're just filling in values. So it sounds, it's very logical. And um, I, this code you don't really need. I wanted to give it to you guys in case that you, you want to, to check. Um, uh, this is what I used to see all the missing values. So I'll, I'll show it really quick, uh, the output. So you see this again, give me uh, all the rows that have a missing value. And so I just picked one of them um, so that I could show it to you guys. So then when I run it, I picked, a, so from 20 to uh, I mean 2020 to 2025, which is pretty coincidental because it's, you know, 2021. Um, but so I picked this one because it's right in the middle and we have our NAN value here. We do not want that. Let's fill it in and let's see what the, uh, what methods we can use for that. And uh, if, if I feel like I'm going fast, just let me know. Uh, I can always clear something up, um, but I wanna make sure, you know, this is more of panda stuff. Uh, it's very important still though. So, um, so one way we could do it is we could just say, use fill NA to say, okay, fill in every NA value with zero. And so this would, if, if we did everything correct, this would be a zero. And so let's check it out. Uh, well, first we see that, okay, we have no longer any NA values. Remember, this is what we use to check uh, if there's any NA values. So let's see what happened to our row 2023. Um, why did the, did the notebook stop itself? Oh no, never mind. It was my computer. Um, and there you go, replaced by a zero. Now, if you look at our data, this is not the best use of fill NA because now we have a station name named zero, uh, which doesn't fit all of our other stations. So this is no good, but know that you can do it. Um, and so I, I put a little note here for you guys, uh, if you wanna refer back to it, fill NA according to the pandas docs, which I linked, um, Docs sometimes are kind of confusing to read, but you start to understand it more and more. So we have backfill or bfill, you can use either one, or pad or ffill. And so bfill, which is actually the one that I'm gonna display, is uh, it takes the value from the next valid observation. So like the next value that, uh, as long as it's not an NA value. Um, and uh, F fill or pad does the same, but it takes the one prior. Excuse me. So now let's see how B fill goes out. Let's run it. Okay, we can't see anything yet because we haven't called it. Uh, we haven't called the data frame or anything. Um, but let's see what happened to our famous road 2023. Oh. And there it is. You see, we replaced it with the value that's going right after it's valid, it's Folsom Street. So now we have Folsom Street. Uh, and it kind of fills in the data, you're imputing it. Uh, and hopefully that adds to having pristine data uh, that you can use in your model. And um, lastly, as a little note, uh, I put imputing values using the preceding value is normally useful when the data has logical order to it. So, you know, if there's some kind of order that continues, this B fill or F fill would make a lot more sense than, uh, you know, if it's random values. Um, so just wanted to let you know. Um, so any questions? I know that might feel like a lot to take in, but it's very logical, right? I hope. Uh, yeah, I have a question. You had a question? Go ahead. Yeah. 
Um, is there, I know it, it, like, it, it might not work with like strings, for example, but let's say if it was a number, is there a way of filling it with the mean? With the mean? Of the column. Uh, I'm pretty sure there is. I think I've even seen, David, you, you've done that before, no? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so you, you wanna, you wanna talk about that, Dave? Uh, we're gonna talk about it later, but one of the strategies of a class that SKLearn has is, is um, to get the average uh, value in the numeric column and put it in for every single uh, null value. And the class I'm talking about is a simple imputer class from SKLearn. Which we'll use after. All right, um, thanks guys. Yeah, no problem. That, good question, because that's, that's really, that's probably the best use of it. Um, if you want to, to have still good data, because you know, uh, we're replacing this, but realistically, this is probably going to mess up our, our data a bit because the distance, the duration that's filled, you see, like, see, it's, it's, it's not the same. It might mess it up, but um, yeah. So I will hand it over to David, who will uh, lead us into scikit-learn. And go ahead, David. Let me share my screen. Can you guys see? Yes. All right. So let's get into uh, the more lead, the, the part where we're leading up to uh, building our model. So first things first, we got our split, our uh, data we're gonna use to predict the values from the values we're, we're trying to predict. So here we are. The convention is to use X, capital X, for the, the columns that we're using to predict and lowercase y for the labels we're trying to predict. So here we are. I'm gonna put a copy of our replaced NA values over here. And we're gonna get a trip duration and put it in Y. When we go over here and get the head of each, we should see that's exactly what's happening. So the, the columns we're using to predict for the bike sharing uh, data, we don't really have any numeric values. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create completely new data just to show you guys a simple way of uh, handling this numeric data. So here we have our right, intensity data and our kitchen and living room size data. And I didn't include any values to predict here, just very simple, simple, simple uh, data frames. And you see here, we have the name of an object with its according lumen uh, and the kitchen size and living room size. So there's two ways to really think about uh, handling this numeric data. And the way you wanna handle it generally is you wanna find a way to get these values as close to each other as possible. The reason for this is we gotta remember that the ML models, models we're gonna be using there, it's like a container for math. And that math uses the average or mean a lot, especially if we're using a, a neural network, which uses RMS propagation, which is root mean squared. So you know you're going to get uh, a lot of impact out of outliers. So one way to handle uh, these outliers is to get the max value of the numeric column and just divide everything else by it. So I'm gonna do it right here. And right here, you should see that sun is the biggest value with the biggest, biggest lumens and everything else is kind of shrink down between zero and one. And that's very, very useful. And you can also do this 
uh, let's say you were doing a computer vision model and you're using neural networks, and you're also going to be using a, a, a sigmoid function while in, in your model. You want to do the same thing, but with the RGB values. And, and, but instead of uh, uh, like the max value in the numeric column, you would uh, divide it by, I think, 255, which is the maximum RG, RGB value, if I remember correctly. Uh, Hermie, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure you're, you're, you're right. And here's a different way. Uh, we're using the scikit-learn and we're going to be using the standard scalar class. Uh, scale, the scale part of this is we're scaling down our values to be closer together, like I said before. So let's initialize our standard scalar right here. And let's scale our things down. So here you'll see that we have the, mod, the, the scalar, which is a standard scale of here, fitted to our kitchen and living room size data frame. And the output is just a, the class. We're gonna get the average, uh, the average uh, scale of each column. And then we're gonna actually transform the columns. So this would be the living, wait, the kitchen, right? Yeah, so this would be the kitchen size sizes scaled down, and this would be the living room sizes scaled down. And you'll see that if you look at the values closely, you can see that the values that are negative are usually the pretty small values compared to the big values. And the big values are in the positive. This means that, oh, this is, so this value right here, which is like 400, this is lower than the average of 1,473. But this one right here, which is, a, I think, 7,000, right? This is 2.339 uh, units larger than the average value. And let's get into handling the categorical data. So, like I said before, the models we're gonna be using, it's just a container for math. And math, for the most part, doesn't really have uh, strings in, inside of it that don't stand for constants. <laughs> so let's look at our X. Like, it's, like we said before, this is our data that we're gonna be using to predict the trip duration seconds. And let's see the unique values in this first column right here, the months column. And we'll see we have January, February, which is spelled wrong here, March, April, and May. So one way to deal with this is a very logical way that I found. Uh, for example, here we have January, February, March, and April, May, but we also know that they have numbers associated with them. So we can replace the string values of these months with their corresponding month uh, number value. So we're gonna replace that here and see now we have, instead of January, we have a one. And as we'll see here, and when I get the unique, we only have the numbers now. And you can do this for binary values as well. I could have gone into user type and since it only has subscriber and customer, that could have been like, oh, zero is a customer and one is a subscriber. And that could have worked as well. And another way of doing it, it's the, the scikit-learn way, which is one hot encoding. So one hot encoding, what it's basically doing, it's separating the, all the strings in the column into different columns. And then it's going to basically say, OK, this is what this row is, and this is what it's not. So as you can see here, in this row, the color is red. So when you one-hot encode it, it's going to say, oh, red, yellow, green, 
this row is one for red, and then it's not yellow or green. And it does that for all the rows. So let's do right here. I saw him. And David? Mm -hmm. So what, why do we use one hot encoding rather than, you know, like any other method? What's the benefits? Okay, so look here for the start station name. Let's let's put it right here. This Foothill Boulevard at Forty Second Avenue. This doesn't. We can't really uh, put a replace it with a value or and. As we said before, let's say there's like a hundred different types of roads here for start station names. We're gonna have numbers from one to a hundred. And those numbers, we're gonna have to scale them down. And that's not that's gonna mess it up. But if it has those numbers from one to a hundred, there's gonna be outliers as well now. So you don't want that. So you just want to have these binary values of zero and one. This is what it is, this is what it's not. Does that make sense? Yep, perfect. All right, so let's show this in action, the one hot encoder. So let's incorporate our one hot encoder from sklearn.preprocessing. We're going to initialize it so when it handles unknown, it's going to get an error and it's going to drop if binary. So basically it's going to uh, make up two columns for user type zero and one, and then it's just going to drop this column. And then we're going to fit it to our data, which is our X. And let's print out the, the transform of what it's going to do to our data. And here you see it's going to do, it's going to have a bunch of zeros for what the, the start station name, what it's not. And then it's going to have like a one in the middle for what it is. All right. Let's get our feature names. And you'll see here all the different columns it made for each and every start station name. It's a lot. And if we actually did the numerical approach to this, we would have a big problem with outliers when we came to the model. So it's better to just one hot encode it. And another way to one hot encode is the get dummies uh, function from pandas. It is, if you want to see it as a data frame, because the one hot encoder right here, this is more like, oh yeah, I'm feeding this into, into a model already, or it's in a pipeline or something. We'll talk about that later. And PD, that's just, okay, let me see it in a data frame. All right. So we'll see here, as of the month April, month February, month January, it's gonna, the first value is going to be January. That's one. And it's going to pull all the star station names until there's. Let's see if I can find the one. Ah, there it is. Start station name. Uh, probably that Fontel uh, Street that we talked about earlier. And then all the way at the end, it's a user type subscriber. Both ways work. Uh, the implementations are just different. So let's split the, all right, now this is a different type of split. We're not splitting the labels or the columns we're gonna use to predict the labels. Now we're going to actually split both the, the X and the Y by the rows. So 
Now we're gonna have those two or four variables named separated into train and test data frames. So why do we need this? So one false thing to do, a very bad practice to do is to train your model on data that you're gonna predict with. So let's say I didn't split this and I trained uh, my model on all the data. Then when it generalizes, it already has the data I'm gonna predict with in account. So that's, uh, shoot, I forgot the name of it, but it's overfit. It's overfit, the data is overfit, meaning that it's, it's okay, it's really good at predicting the data it was trained with, but not good for predicting the data it wasn't trained with. So that's why you wanna split into train and test sets. We're gonna use, all right, we're gonna reset it right here. And we're gonna use the train test split. We're gonna have, it's the train test split outputs four variables the X train, the training set of the values we're gonna to use to, to train, the test, which is our validation, what we're gonna to use to see how well the model is trained, the Y train and the Y test. And the good thing about the train test split is that it shuffles the data for us uh, because this the data we have we don't really need it in a sequential order, like from month to month. We can just shuffle it and, and have it go in our model shuffled. This test size here is 0 0.2. This means that 2% of our data is actually, or hold on, 20% of our data is gonna be split into the, into the test set. And the random state here, this is just an indicator for uh, the seed value. And the seed value is just a thing uh, we use so that the model all, or the, the split always happens in the same way. So let's go ahead and split our data. And then let's output the shape so you see that it actually works. So the X train shape, we have 842,453 rows. And for the validation or the test, we have 210,614 rows. I bet you added together these would be this, which is the, the, the entire data set, which is a, a million 53,067 rows. And this is the special part we were talking about. This is called a data pipeline. So what is a pipeline? A pipeline, I'm gonna give you guys the Lego explanation. So you can think of the pipeline in three parts. You have the pre-processing, this is where the data goes in. And the second Lego, this is your model. Your, the pre-processed data goes into a model. And then the third Lego, is the prediction. This is where the output of your pipeline and what you really want. So let's import our tools. We're gonna get a COM transformer. This is just to transform all our comms using simple imputer and one-hot encoder. We're, and we're gonna get the pipeline. So because our data, the data we're gonna use to predict with, that which is the X, does not have numerical values or columns. I'll leave this list blank, but you need to have it just in case. And for categorical columns, I put the month, start station name and user type. And we're gonna use, we talked about this uh, a, a little while ago, the simple imputer and our strategy, we're gonna use constant. And this strategy is basically what Hermes was talking about the other time, which was to fill the NA values with a constant. 
or like, like zero, one, two, or three. Uh, the reason we don't want to use the backfill or, or those is we don't, we're not really sure uh, which column has the most effect on the model. But since it's only like 745 missing values, it won't really matter that much. So let's create a pipeline. So you were initially initializing the class, which is the pipeline. And for steps, we're gonna have a list here, which is our imputer, which is gonna be the simple imputer. Most frequent is for categorical. And for some reason, yeah, it does the numerical transformer. And for some reason, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. So this was actually the numerical transformer. So in case we did have numerical columns, uh, the, the simple imputer we have here was just input whatever constant value it, it has. But for, but for our categorical values, which is our string values, we actually want to use the most frequent strategy which is just getting the most frequent string value in the column and putting it in. And our one hot encoder, it, it's just gonna, it's just gonna do what we said before. We're just gonna split the columns and say what it is, say what it isn't. And if it, if it goes, if it finds any unknown values, it's just gonna ignore it. Well, probably don't wanna do that if, if you don't have uh, something to fill it in. So let's do the com transformer here. This is gonna transform our columns before we put them into our model. And we have the numerical transformer, which is what we talked about up here, which is a simple computer with the constant strategy on our numerical columns. We don't have any, the cat, which is just, these are just names for the transformers. It can be anything. Uh, categorical transformer, which is right here on our categorical columns, month, start, say, see, name, user type. And this is our model. So for the model, we're gonna be using a random forest regressor. And a very simple explanation of this because I know this is more of a pre-processing workshop, but want to see it in action, right? So random forest regressor is just a, a really big tree. And for this one, we're going to have a hundred layers, but it's just a really big decision tree that, that in the end gives you a constant value. And the constant value that we want is the trip duration seconds. So let's create our model right here. And to actually fit our model or train it, we would get this metric to see how good it's trained. And here we would create the entire pipeline again, the preprocessor and the model right here. And then we would fit the training data. And that's what it would use to train. Uh, when I ran this for the first time, it took 30 minutes. So I'm not going to run it again. So what I did do, I imported Joblet, which is a serialization uh, library. And I pickled the pipeline. And pickle is just a way of saving variables or objects for later. So I pickled it right here. Uh, it's right here. This is the pickle. This is our serialized pipeline. And this is very useful. And we're going to load it in. We're going to load it in. And then we're going to use that pipe, that train pipeline, to predict the values for X tests. And then we're going to match those predictions to the actual values and get our mean absolute error. And the mean absolute error 
basically saying what's on average how how off is the prediction of the model compared to the true values and as we'll see just loading it in even loading it in takes a while because that just shows how big it is And as we can see here, our mean absolute error is 466.827 or 828. And this is about 7.8 minutes off. So on average, our model is off by 7.8 minutes. And the cool thing about this is that we can actually create our own data and use this pipeline to predict it. So Anyone have any suggestions for the data? Let me bring it in. So this is our month. All right, give me some months. Give me some months. November. November. Uh, I don't think we trained our model with November. <laughs> Uh, January. January. Okay. Let me make sure I'm I'm spelling February wrong, like these people did. The people that created the, the data. Yeah. Uh, disclaimer: We did not spell that. Although I wouldn't be surprised, but we did not, for once. Yeah. Let's just copy this down. January, all right, give me another one. January again. Oh, they capitalize it. Lazar was gonna say something. Yeah, mm -hmm. May. All right, May. All right, one more. One more, who wants? Uh, who else is here? Asi said March. March? All right, March. And let's go to another. So we did three, so we're gonna have to do three of three of start station names. All right, let me get some random names open here. Let's do Myrtle Street at Polk Street. Let's do, let me see another one. San Carlos, St. At hey Hermes, can you check real quick if to see if that at is in the original data? If what is in the original data? Yeah. The at this at because I don't wanna I don't wanna use yeah, the yeah. encoded ones. Carlos. And one last one. Uh, let's see, let's see. Let's do this one, Lincoln Avenue. All right. Yeah, the at, the at is here. Like All right, perfect. And then our final column, which is a user type. User type, let me make sure I'm capitalizing it right. All right. All right, give me subscriber or customer. It can be either or. Flip a coin. What is it? First one, what do you want? 
customer. Customer. All right. Let me make sure I'm spelling it right. All right. Capital. Customer. All right. All right. I mean, you should do user or subscriber. And then let me do customer again. All right, this is a data frame. Oh, I'm going to hash will type data. Did I accidentally? Did I screw up? Hold on, did I, where did I screw up? Oh, um, isn't it because it's supposed to be a, a Oh, whoops, whoops, whoops. Yeah, hold on. I, I wasn't supposed to put these inside a dictionary in here. And making these things manually is not easy. <laughs> no. And we'll show our con. What do we call this? Data? Data. It's, it's pretty short, so. Let's see. Let's hope. And then let's put this into our data frame. PD. Data. Data, make sure it's capital frame. And our data equals data man. Now that I see it, let me made up MU. Yeah. We're all about that healthy data handling. Uh, that's 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 called this data frame mu df all right and let's see our mu df right here Oof, looking pretty clean pretty clean so let's predict okay. let's see what our pipeline thinks these people that went to bike at Myrtle Street at Polk Street, which is a customer on January. Let's see how how long our model thinks they uh, rode their bikes. So let's copy this now. It's gonna predict our MUDF. All right. Let's see. Let's see. What does it think? All right. So for the first uh, person that's a customer riding on from start station. Myrtle Street at Polk Street to wherever on January. The model things, our pipeline things, they're going to go 1,547.5 sec seconds. I got you on the minutes. <laughs> and 600 is 10 minutes. 1,200, that's 20 minutes. Uh, plus 300, I think that's about five minutes. So about 25 minutes, the model thinks it's going to go. This person is going to go. And for the subscriber at San Carlos Street at Market Street on a May, the model thinks 673. That's about 10 minutes and some change. Yeah. And for the customer on Osiris Avenue at Lincoln Avenue on a March, 
it's going to say, all right, 1,026. Mm -hmm. oh, you, you know what? Let's add one more column. One more. Yeah, oh, yeah. One more row. One more row. One more row. Let's make it in the same month. March. Actually, two more rows. May. Oh, wait. Yeah. May. And then let's copy this. Only one of those areas. Ah. Ah. Deep no why. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, deep note. Gotta do it the hard way, guy. Hey, good thing I'm a fast typer. You've been practicing that typing. So what I'm trying to do is see how how the, how much the month and how much the user type affects the prediction. Yeah, you, you made a typo on the screen. Uh, I did? Yeah, the, you made the, the I and the A are switched. All right, do it for me. Yeah, yeah I fixed it. I did it again. <laughs> but yeah, Ozzy, Ozzy has a point, control V. You don't got to be a fast typer. And let's say this is where we had a month the same. So let's make it a subscriber. Subscribe. Let me see. Make sure I put it right. <laughs> My accuracy is kind of wonky, but I'm a fast typer. Yeah, let's see. Uh, customer. Also, since this is going on YouTube, if you're seeing this, subscribe. <laughs> subscribe to DSC. So that's your data. Let's make it a data frame. Let's pop it off over here. All right, so here we have some of the same. Let's say, let's say the, let's give it a story. The person here, he saw that the bike sharing app was pretty good, so he subscribed. But then the a couple months go by, and he, and he thinks he's not really going to use it anymore, so he's just a regular customer. So let's see how the user type and the month affects the prediction for this person right here. All right. Looks like our model is kind of overfit. So it seems like the subs it changed from subscriber, and because there's less data for subscriber, it just automatically says, "All right, subscriber lower lower trip duration." And for a month, uh, looks like less time in May. Maybe maybe it's kind of rainy over there in California. You know the bay area during may i don't know but it says it's lower during that time and okay. that's pretty interesting and one and of another benefit of having a pipeline is the continuous uh, improvement so you you can pickle the pipeline like i did before but you can also get new data and retrain the pipeline so that it can actually do more months, more streets for another user type. And you can improve it and then pickle it again and replace the, the old pickle with the new pickle. And that's the pre-processing workshop, guys, with a little bit extra. Thanks for coming. Yeah, yeah. And uh, before before we wrap it up, if there's anything that 
we want you guys to take away from this, apart from all the pre-processing, is uh, what David just mentioned is the, the how important pickling is. I mean, like he said, it, it took 30 minutes to, to train the model, but then by pickling it, you can use it over and over without having to retrain the whole thing. Uh, so it's extremely useful. Right, David? Oh, yes. We should have used it more often uh, during our eBay challenge. Yeah, we, we, don't, <laughs> we don't need to know. Yeah, yeah we should have. Uh, but, but now we know. Because now we know. Um, but okay, well, thank you guys for coming. Um, I hope you enjoyed. I mean, what do you guys think? How was it? Pretty interesting, right? Pretty interesting, if I do say so myself. But let me let me uh, uh, just quickly. Uh, indeed, indeed. One more, one more time. You, know, you have to end it off because Josh he he joined late, so he wasn't able to see your masterpiece. Oh I, yes, the masterpiece. You see, this is you. Semi interesting. Oh no, we have a, a fake a fake AI person in here. Yeah, but uh, yeah, exactly, Lazarus. You, you see why it's so useful, and and thank you, Aussie. Um, so yeah, I hope that's your brain on on Scikit Learn. And after our workshop, uh, you learn quite a lot, hopefully. And we will have this recorded, so if you want to always go back, um, feel free to. And yeah, David, anything else? And as always. We want to encourage you guys to use these tools on your own because who knows, you might, you might get put on some board that's very visible in the community. Not, not leaking anything, yeah, just yeah. suggesting it. Just, just saying, just saying we, we might, but uh, yeah, always be doing projects. It's very important and share it with us like Lazarus did. That's awesome to hear. And if you ever want us to showcase it in our workshop, uh, reach out. All right, thank you. Yeah. That's it. <laughs>